this? This was France, August 1944. It was a kind of honeymoon for the American army and the American people. Remember at home we were worrying about reconverting war plants to civilian production. Remember we were worrying that we would be left with too many shells and too many tanks when the war ended? Remember we were looking around for a job in some civilian industry so we wouldn't get caught short when the need for machine guns and bandages was suddenly over? Well, the honeymoon ended. On December 16th, the triumphant cheers died down in Europe. In the Christmas season of 1944, nobody was predicting that the war would end by Saturday night or a week from Wednesday. And today, with the good news from all fronts singing on all radios, let us remember the dying days of 1944. The infantry remembers those days. They were not being reconverted for civilian production, nor were they worried then or ever that they would be left with too many shells or too many tanks. The army had come fast and far last fall. We had developed a certain tendency to become complacent. Complacency came to an end in time for the Christmas season. These men had never been complacent. As they fought, they did not seek employment in civilian industry that would secure them after the war. They did not complain about the scarcity of butter or roast beef or the high cost of living. The cost of living on the Cologne Plain was considerably higher than in the United States, but they did not discuss it in their clubs. In December, we learned all over again the bitter lesson of war. War is conducted in mist and turmoil and uncertainty. Victory comes on no silver platters. The enemy sells nothing cheaply. The enemy is resourceful, courageous, desperate. The Nazi party is willing to sacrifice every building and every soul in Germany to stave off defeat. Reserves of men and material had been hoarded for the day of counterattack. Under cloudy skies and close hanging ground mists that defied aerial observation, the very much alive German army gathered its forces in the forest isles to strike one strong decisive blow at the American army. New and refitted divisions were brought up under cover of fog, darkness and forest. A fury of robot and rocket weapons was unleashed against our front. In one day, the enemy smashed through the defenses of the American First Army on a 45-mile front and was biting deep into Luxembourg and Belgium. In 24 hours, the initiative changed hands and the German army, which had put the word Blitzkrieg into all languages, unleashed its desperate offensive. They had picked a time when the weather prevented us from using the air weapon, the weapon in which we decisively outweigh them. This film is being shown for the first time was captured from a German cameraman. He had taken it so that the German home front might gloat over the evidence of the success of Rundstedt's attack. In August, it was German convoys that were caught like this along the French roads. Now it was our convoys, ruined, burning where they'd been overrun. The sweat and iron of Detroit and Pittsburgh became the wreckage of Malmedy and saint vite we lost more than jeeps and half-tracks, tires and shells, tanks and guns. We lost men, 78,000 in dead, wounded and missing. Unarmed and defenseless American prisoners, comrades of these men, fell to the machine guns of our enemies. Fire! Four weeks 
weeks later, their frozen bodies, hands and ankles bound, were found where they fell. These Belgian enemies of the Third Reich, too, were unarmed and defenseless. Germans smoked camels and Chesterfields robbed from American dead. And the Nazi cameraman filmed it to amuse and reassure the moviegoers of Munich and Berlin. not retreated since their arrival in Europe, plodded back along the mean roads of winter Belgium. Convoys of trucks streamed to the rear with supplies that had been painstakingly accumulated at forward dumps. Supplies that could not be moved were put to the torch. Millions of man hours of work to be put in all over again. To stop counterattacks, huge new reserves of supplies are called for. But that is how a war is. Wasteful, unpredictable, uncertain, dangerous, demanding constant wariness, constant preparation for the worst, a constant and unflagging spirit in the face of all alarms and disasters. Gallant American units, surrounded and cut off, fought in a sea of enemy armor. Anti-aircraft guns were fired point-blank as anti-tank guns until they were overrun. Cooks, bakers, quartermaster and line of communications troops picked up their rifles and fought tenaciously against Nazi columns. The weather cleared and the Air Force took to the skies to bomb and strafe and fight the rejuvenated Luftwaffe to the ground. was blunted, the spearhead stopped, the Nazi columns contained and thrown back by men who had flung themselves into the breach. In the wild gamble of war, a momentary equilibrium had been gained. The cost had been great, and there were no guarantees being issued on engraved paper on the Western Front that the time of counterattacks was over. Nor, despite the great victories in the Pacific, were there guarantees being issued that there would be no counterattacks against the many islands we'd won back from the Japs? In the general uncertainty of war, one fact remains certain. The enemy is always dangerous. The enemy always wants to kill Americans. The enemy does not slack off. Is the news good from Russia? Remember the lesson of December. As another Japanese admiral died, remember the Arden Forest. Does it look as though finally we can take it easy? Remember the 78,000 Americans lost in the Christmas holidays. The men in the line pay for counterattacks in dead, wounded, and missing. How do you intend to pay? What were you doing the week the German army came back to Belgium? What are you doing this week? What will you be doing next week? <laughs> <laughs>